the 1982 College World Series, Round 2, Wichita State, an offensive juggernaut who led college baseball in nearly every batting statistic and featured Phil Stevenson, who led the country in stolen bases. To this day, Stevenson holds the NCAA career stolen bases record. This was as aggressive of a team as you'll see. They faced the University of Miami, who many believed lacked the talent and star power to be successful in this tournament, but they had grit and they gave themselves a chance in the form of the most well-designed hidden ball trick in the history of the game of baseball. Check this out. I don't know, unless the mustache is <laughs> steel. Might be. Ball is thrown away. Down into the... Oh, now they've cut it off, and Stevenson is going to be out. How about that? How about that for a decoy play? Fool everybody in the ballpark, I, including us. What, that is an outstanding play. Mike Kasperzak steps off the rubber and fakes a pickoff play to first. First baseman Steve Lusby bails out over top of the runner, Stevenson, as if it's a passed ball. And when Stevenson tries to locate the ball, he sees the entire Miami dugout pointing to where the ball allegedly landed. Even the bullpen guys and the ball girls sold it to perfection. So Stevenson takes off, only to land in an easy tag out at second. Kasperzak had the ball the entire time. Everyone in Omaha bought the fake, including the camera crew. Even the commentators were at a loss for words. Despite their lack of hype and pedigree, Miami stole all the momentum in this game and to an extent the entire College World Series tournament. These two teams would meet again in the championship game. Miami would stifle the Shockers 9-3. The play was so good that it would be coined the Grand Illusion which was most likely a reference to the triple platinum album by the rock band Styx released five years prior, notably on July 7, 1977. The album spawned the classic single Come Sail Away, in which Dennis DeYoung rides out themes of escapism in first an aquatic ship, later a starship, with the take-home point being follow your dreams. And though this grand illusion was situated firmly within the consciousness of America in 1982, I find it interesting that the album actually gets its name from a 1937 French war film directed by Jean Renoir, which is regarded as one of the greatest films of all time. The film uses the juxtaposition of the two main characters, Baldu and Rofenstein, both aristocrats who, despite being leaders on opposite sides of the conflict, spark up a friendship based on their devotion to their upper-class social maxims, even touching on issues that alienate them both from the lower-class citizens of their own nations. Both see their power diminishing over time. This angle allows Renoir to drive home the point that class should be viewed as a non-factor in Western politics moving forward. We haven't done too well with that, have we? Anyway, spoiler to a movie you probably weren't planning to watch, Rofenstein is forced to shoot Boldu, but they continue to bond on the idea that their privilege is completely misunderstood, yet totally necessary. Boldu dies. That shit's groundbreaking, but what's possibly even more intriguing was how the film managed to masterfully denounce anti-Semitism prior to World War II. What I'm getting at is, this was the perfect underdog baseball play executed by an underdog baseball team, named after a song encouraging the underdog to follow his dreams, named after a movie that spawned an entire political movement for underdogs. This is brilliant. It's all brilliant. Every single piece of it, except for one glaring issue. Is baseball even a blue collar sport anymore? At all? Is it even possible today for blue collar kids to follow their dreams to the big leagues? In 1981, Major League Baseball hit its peak for rostered African Americans at 18.7%. Today that figure sits at 7.6%. This sentiment that the game of baseball is losing this demographic is especially tragic given the role the game has played in the civil rights movement as a whole. This is the sport that united all Americans, regardless of race or nationality. Each year we have Jackie Robinson Day. Each player wears number 42, yet players who resemble Jackie are few and far between. 
baseball is expensive to get into. Not only is the specialized equipment required increasing in price, but baseball is a sport that rewards repetition. The more you pitch, hit, and field baseballs, the better you get. Kids who play year-round and play travel ball obviously gain an advantage, but there's a financial toll involved in playing outside of Little League or whatever other low-cost rec league exists in its place. Travel ball, though often well-intentioned, creates this phenomenon of a buy-in to increase player development. The richer your parents, the more opportunities present themselves. This Sports Illustrated article featuring Preston Wilson explains why this is specifically taxing on families in the inner cities. The article goes on to suggest that economic shortcomings are also keeping talented minority players off of college baseball rosters. If you're an athlete looking for a way out of a tough situation, baseball just isn't the move. NCAA Division I schools offer 85 football scholarships per year. The baseball team, by comparison, is allotted just 11. So a majority of college baseball rosters are filled by kids whose parents are paying for them to be there. It's quite finite. If you can't pay your way through college and you go undrafted out of high school, your baseball dreams are essentially over, so capital delegates whether or not your team looks more like 1982 Wichita State or more like 1982 Miami. I got to thinking, in addition to the inner cities, I know another blue collar area. If you haven't picked it up from the way I talk, I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains. Don't confuse this area with the Deep South where literally tons of pro ball players are from because you can play all year. The region of Appalachia encapsulates the entirety of West Virginia, as well as parts of Virginia, Kentucky, North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, hell, even a good bit of Pennsylvania. Despite the beautiful scenery and fantastic bluegrass music, this geographic region is well known for its decrease in jobs, increase in poverty, outdated technology, and basically just being a soft target culturally, dating back all the way when our Scots-Irish ancestors settled the place. Extraction-based industries have come and gone, but what will always remain here is a general distrust for American industry entirely. I like this article's take on it. Appalachia, the big white ghetto. In Appalachia, jobs have vanished and people live for pills, soda pop, and welfare. We are indeed the center of the American opiate epidemic, but shit. Oh, check this one out. Third World America. That's a little harsh, right? Well, many communities around here literally have an infrastructure resembling that. It's bleak, man. I've lived in several different zip codes where they're required by law to list all the different heavy metals present in your drinking water on the back of your monthly water bill. And there's quite a few. Needless to say, there aren't many young baseball players overcoming these conditions and taking up residence on big league rosters. That's not to say we didn't once have our poster child, though. This is our guy right here, John Cruck. Born in Charleston, West Virginia, raised in Kaiser, West Virginia. Some tall tales say was born with that mullet, kind of like a real-life Joe Dirt situation. Cruck was a three-time All-Star, but he seemed like the kind of guy who also drove the team bus to the game and skipped warm-ups to sample bratwursts. The guy who showed us that all the Randy Johnson hype was indeed real. He had a made-for-TV personality that served him well in his career after baseball. President Clinton loved the guy. Chris Farley played him on Saturday Night Live. We've seen him as an analyst, as well as all those great MLB on ESPN commercials. He did video game voiceover for several years for the MLB 2K series. But we all know his greatest television moment was playing himself on the greatest show of all time, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Give it a shot. Why well, don't dance? Let's I'm totally wasted. All right, then let's get wasted. Bam, bam, ba da doop one of the most charismatic players from one of the most charismatic eras of baseball, the 90s. Crook's flashy, but I'd say the ultimate blue-collar baseball hero happened to be a childhood hero of my own, though I didn't get to see him play often because of the cable situation. Billy Wagner grew up in Marion, Virginia to poor teenage parents and spent time living with different amalgamations of relatives throughout the years, literally on food stamps. He was a natural right-hander, but after fracturing his right arm a couple times, he switched, and would of course become a fireball closer with his non-dominant arm. Talk about overcoming adversity. Undrafted out of high school because of his stature, just 5'5", five five, Billy Wagner attended Ferrum College where he posted one of the most insane college stat lines ever and was picked up by the Houston Astros in the first round of the 1993 MLB Draft. He had one hell of a career. 
Here's his appearance in a 2003 combined no-hitter. He has three more years of Hall of Fame consideration left, and I'm pulling for him. Everybody loves those feel-good baseball movies. The Billy Wagner story has to be the next one, right? The dude just refused to take no for an answer, but with the financial strain it takes to make it in baseball today, how many Billy Wagners do you think have become victims of circumstance and we've never heard their name called? And you know, the real question is, can we live with that? Is it morally acceptable, given the working class history of the game of baseball, that so many kids don't get a fair shake solely based on their socioeconomic circumstances where they were born? Or does this all feed a greater narrative? Does the underdog only thrive if he's threatened by bigger, stronger competition? If Wichita State didn't sport the most potent offense of all time in 1982, Devil's Advocate says Miami doesn't pull off the grand illusion. They never try it. I'd like to get Dennis DeYoung and Jean Renoir's thoughts on that. Take it easy.